Happy 2024 everyone! Today we talk about a filing rank uh, topic that however is very much overlooked and in actual fact extremely important for medieval warfare that is the role of the sergeant. Uh, that we will see today from the um, say cat angle of the Crusades because it's for our Crusades warfare uh, playlist but that de facto overlaps with um, other videos that we have yet to make actually at least specifically about surgeons um, that uh, of course we will deal with in some greater depth and sort of also um, political and even social detail because as you know this figure today we talk about again the crusading era in the in the holy land um to just three centuries not even just as a period um but um of course this the the sergeant as such was um a prominent uh, uh class where right? professional soldiers serve uh under knights right uh we will see now what makes it uh, approximately slash stereotypically in fact typical characteristic of the uh the holy land because there are some dynamics in fact that differed there from uh the european one at least for the soldiers that well okay both for the sergeants that were there just um they were settled there for good and the in fact european sergeants that uh, uh came like for a just for a certain amount of time to serve uh in the in the holy land and then would come back home together with their uh masters which is a term uh, in fact should be somehow also careful to uh, to use because uh from the 11th to the 13th century you have an important degree of change in the figure uh not just of the sergeant but to um today we talk about the mounted sergeant Right, which is definitely more typical than the, the foot one, right? But aside from the fact that the same knights um, mounted, dismounted on a regular basis, and sergeant being more sort of lighter troops and subjected to the knights, at least in this context where cavalry was um, decisive, um, most of the times uh, they would also largely fight on foot. This is especially. Um, uh, to be seen in different battles, uh, think about the Rillium, right, when the crusading army gets ambushed, and, uh, of course, uh, especially horses were quite vulnerable to the hail of um, Seljuk uh, arrows, and so forced many of these otherwise habitually mounted troops to, to dismount, uh, to engage, to, to just to resist, but also to eventually counterattack, never underestimate... Um, the the aggressive capacity and even the speed right of these guys were mounted and dismounted compared to uh hit and run tactics always remember that uh, there is not definitely from a tactical point of view any proof of a um islamic or byzantine superiority compared to these essentially western um western knights right the same idea that just if you are heavier you're slower it's n tendentially the case but not always like that, and in any case, um, if you need to run away um, as your default horse archer strategy, it's because fundamentally you admit to be weaker. Um, and of course, it's always about a very balanced combined arm system, for which, of course, the heavy element also among the, the, the Muslim forces was uh, calibrated with that. But overall, right, um, armies, forces, strength are not the same. Uh, I made, especially back in the day, lots of videos about crusading um i mean battles of, of in the holy land uh in crusading times and we have observed how concrete this this is uh, we will keep that some of them i had to re-upload because um, they date before the 2021 and i have as you know a renewed content as far as the uh creative commons uh license images are concerned so at some point i will use that as a filler of you know the rap loads etc um but it's always fascinating to observe this um let's say this context right uh when we look at uh, sergeants we understand uh them as um typically a lower social status compared to knights essentially they were um some 
land holders, right? At least people who had game being granted a title uh, of land, but also of uh, could be um, money thief, right? We've seen it in multiple videos I've made also recently about the organization of the, especially the Kingdom of Jerusalem, that we do have, in fact, um, in quite some detail uh, for uh, this uh, say different um, types of, you know, revenues that these guys were uh, to contribute militarily in, in proportion for the for the local authority, right? Um, but, of course, this is not simply as that, right? They, um, and they of course, as, as, as uh, landholders, they had similar privileges to what we call knights, right? Um, the Latin terminology, as we will understand here, is tricky because it's not much because we do not know who surgeons were, what their role actually was, um, but we're not often told of all the troops that were fighting in a battle how many surgeons were there, given that most of the sources talk just about knights, and they do so also in a, with a terminology that is the one of milites, which is actually a more generic soldiery rather than... Yes, it was used at, at this point at the peak of um, feudalism in Europe, definitely as um, the equivalent of knight, but knighthood entails um, throughout its development, especially in the later Middle Ages, um, uh, say a Properly a formal mm, ceremonial, mm, think about the dubbing, I mean, but a recognition broadly meant uh, of what was the Cingulum Militaris as in some hierarchical um, privilege in the, in the imperial, uh, in the imperial system, um, really meant as he who has the Cingulum, who bears the sword, is actually, you know, sort of a sacred fighter. Uh, independently from the crusading role that we discuss here. So it becomes, especially again in later Middle Ages, a much uh, greater social uh, divide um, in a much higher hierarchy. In previous centuries, the divide was mostly connected with the uh, originary sense that was a, a nobleman, uh, sla say in the guise of a uh, milas, right? As a properly as a military class that, as you know, had been defining itself in a very steep way socially from the 10th century onwards, um, and um, that controlled, right, in its uh, with its retinue, its clientele, a certain amount of fighters who just were under him. Think about the masnata, the senior, and the. Um, concept, in fact, of the war band, this was typically the same thing, right? And the medieval knight, um, as we'll see now, also develops, as you know, in an ever more um, um, sort of elitistic way, also technically, panoplistically, so that the, 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 the retinues and the guys who follow these guys become ever more sort of integrated arm system that you can have a concrete idea of at the end of the Middle Ages with the companies, with the, the very specialized role that every guy really had with the men-at-arm uh, really leading the way of these smaller war bands, right? So it's very interesting to analyze that from that original standpoint because it's much more... It's much closer than we think in meaning for them at the time that we have liked to sort of present in a economistic or socialistic way rather than the actual origin of the um, imperial Catholic tradition, uh, of course. And of course, uh, we will keep talking about knights. For those who do not know, there is a medieval knighthood playlist that... Um, explains a bit also this passage from say the, the warband leader right uh to into the the actual medieval knight right and so uh, we should get used to that sort of uh, of narrative the interesting aspect however for reasons that are maybe i will not digress on because they're complex at least um is that i'd say in fact in the 11th century let's say if we look at the first crusade right the average what would have been called a sergeant was rather, again, a subordinate, like not the equivalent of a squire, really, but something approaching that, in between that and the milas, right? So a guy, a soldier proper, that was 
um, militarily capable in a way that could be um, uh, supplementary, let's put it in this way, to the role of the knight, right? Much of the role of the modern sergeants, for example, that as you know are, you know, some of the toughest motherfuckers out there in terms of properly leading the troop um, as the, just above, they have the first officers, basically. Um, and the sense of sacrifice, the sense of exposing oneself, of getting, um, you know, over the top um, and leading the, the, the path, etc., is and, and protecting, right, the other troops is, is something still auxiliary to the officer, that it's as if that had been denied, right? Um, and that, however, is, as you know, vital, right? Especially from a tactical point of view. So actually all the dirtiest um, jobs, uh, the, the, the riskiest actions, etc., were possible, especially with the weigh-in of the um, knightly panoply, thanks to these guys. Again, at the beginning of the video, uh, of the, excuse me, of the period, we do not really have um, much of a, even a, of a divide, right? The Mila's equipment, admittedly, wouldn't change that much, like, even from the previous century, but, of course, was, um, was, um, um, rather similar to other lower forms of um, a fighter. Even if you look at the Bayeux tapestry, yes, you do see this uh, sometimes even uh, helmetless guys with uh, similar, you know, kind shaped shields riding. Um, it would have been that kind of guy, right? Um, with perhaps a bit more of padding armor or something, especially for the head. While by the end of the Crusading period, in the 13th century, especially the end of it, you really have a process which is quite fascinating for which the sergeant or any non-knightly element uh, let's say in cavalry seems to have become at least for those who really fought in in the in the battle lines uh, the armies were composed by and so acted as a unique uh, compact unit a mass of cavalry injected at different times to a gradually fought into combat um, to have actually become, in a technical sense, um, as performing and as well equipped, armed as the actual knights, right? This is a notorious, typical uh, Evenians. One sees it in the early, I mean, in the late 13th, the beginning of the 14th century. Um, you have the idea that these militas are just forming compact in Western warfare, especially this compact and sort of unique type of cavalry that really exists. This is a bit superficial because especially sergeants, as we will see now, um, would have been in certain contexts, of course, capable, just like the knights actually, but more frequently because of how they were regularly equipped in a slightly different way throughout this period, you know, a slightly lighter way um, in this period than the actual knights to perform different tactical roles, such as even mounted archery, I made a video about the mounted crossbowmen of this times, but uh, mounted archers in Western warfare had always been around. Uh, it was nothing strange, like there weren't so many, admittedly, because Western warfare was sort of much bulkier in terms of um, people, wealth, um, and consequently, um, you know, fortresses and uh, and ar say, army uh, institutions, mi military institutions, army corps, concentration. And so they didn't need, uh, also because they were literally wealthier per capita. Um, all those, say, horse archers of the Turco-Mongol tradition, for example. You, you notice this even, for example, with certain parts of the, Avar, uh, of the Arab world compared to, the, to Central Europe, like Arabs, as, if you look at Egyptian warfare, for example, during the Crusade period, it, it's sort of much closer to Western warfare than it is to the Turco-Persian Mongol tradition in many ways, and because they were more sedentary and more, in this sense, relying even on tougher infantry um, to some degree, and uh, I made some videos up here and there about this and that um, battle or army organization to sort of exemplify that, but exemplifies that. But um, we really have a lot to talk about. Um, uh, always remember that even in Western warfare, it was sort of the most feudalized uh, in this uh, Euro Mediterranean space. The um, the the actual dominance of cavalry on the battlefield uh, occurs in the 
mid uh, 3rd, 4th of the 12th century. Meaning that until the, the, the early 14th century wouldn't have, you wouldn't see actually, there wouldn't be um, any instance in which infantry actually defeated cavalry on the field alone. Right, this is very important to stress. This is to say not that cavalry was literally operating just by itself. Um, that's not what the size, uh, cavalry su mm, decisiveness really means. Um, it means that you do not find an infantry army that is able to withstand the cavalry, domin uh, cavalry dominated army. So also with infantry in it, because it was all about combined arms as always. And so even just fighting as infantry only wasn't actually a compliment when this you know that I am very fixated with this topic because I uh, give especially to the early 14th century infantry victories not not an unimportant role I actually wrote a doctoral thesis of 700 pages almost on the same topic but um, that um, that actually stems from underdeveloped areas and that there is nothing not, nothing really progressive or teleological about infantry had at that point becoming the future of warfare also because with the mid 14th century there is a, a traumatic contraction uh, of infantry again and so you have to wait the mid 15th century actually to see it rise again so people often have this idea of linearity and progressivity but it's not the case before the mid 12th century what you have from the early Middle Ages is actually cavalry superiority, which uh, is not decisive, meaning that uh, there are still instances in which infantry, uh, that very often could be the same knights dismounted, by the way, uh, would be able to defeat cavalry charges. Um, uh, this is incredibly relevant, and uh, I'd say that Western Europe as a whole was quite compact in this. Even when we look at the Italian or Flemish infantries of the time, they were essentially the the toughest ones um, in this period, they they ne I mean they do exist even for a prolonged time. Sometimes even from throughout the whole fighting day against cavalry charges, but either they break in the end or they in any, in any case that their own cavalry um, uh, really wins the battle. Um, and so it's something again extremely different from what had happened a little would happen a bit uh, a bit later than this and had been happening in a in a sense albeit unlikely a long time before this um this is incredibly important to understand the actual feudal warfare like in the highly late uh, also the early middle ages because it's not that sort of linear nor um uh, again teleological or deter deterministic as we think right um so the mounted sergeant is uh, sort of a mysterious figure, as we will uh, realize now, right? Um, they were fully part of this feudal system, uh, as they were employed by their lords to provide military service. They couldn't quite escape the hierarchy, right, at that point. They play an important role, as we'll see now, as both cavalry and infantry units. Uh, and they had this, again, supportive role which in many ways was really vital for the for their commanded officers to, to use an anachronistic uh, term, right? But even again, the contemporary divide, uh, say of the various ranks in the hierarchy, actually does reflect in the sergeants and in in their in fact position in the in the same hierarchy this specific function. Um, and uh, the, again, we, we have said that knights were known for their heavy armor and horseback combat. Surgeons were often more likely equipped and versatile. Yes, there, there were probably some surgeons who were levied as infantry, just not dismounted cavalry. But as, as I just said, right, um, at that point, the function... Now, this, this would be important because infantry and cavalry would fight like combined arms, but still as different uh, units. Whereas if you had a mounted sergeant, this would fight actually in the same unit with a knight. This distinction is incredibly important, right? The, um, I think what was the standard tactic for a long time that we have, that the sources do not really show before certain times and only for certain places later in the Middle Ages was this, the idea of having the, the, the infantry located on the wings of cavalry. And technically not even, just because they were not considered fully 
freemen, in a sense. Um, this would be also another thing to consider. We're not even considered part of that battle line, meaning the battle line was actually just the cavalry, and these um, other commoners were sort of something subject to, to, to that and just supporting on, on the wings. And for the same fact that they fought on horseback, especially in this traumatically elitistic um, societies, of course, they were considered lesser people. They didn't have a true relevance, right? For the same reason why, as we've seen, they weren't able as infantry to win just against against cavalry, but it's not a classistic division. I mean, they, they were essentially dependent, even as surgeons, um, on the, the various masters. It's a bit like uh, in the later Middle Ages with the companies, you see um, the... Um, essentially all those different types of soldiers say uh with the lanks you know they have the men-at-arm you have two other you know lighter troops and uh a horseman and then i don't know the longbowman the, the gunner whatever and each of them would actually fight they would when they made up the battle lines the commanders formed them they would form all in different uh units right they, so they didn't really actually fight together there could be some circumstances in which this could happen, especially if you deployed them in, in, in depth to some degree, but mostly they were literally, again, the, all the, the archers grouped in some place, all the, the men at arms in another. So, uh, especially, again, on horseback, the sense is that the, the medieval knight was the sort of tank, like, um, uh, at that point, gunner in a way, uh, that was actually also the commander, but you would have... Um, there are uh, a squire, surgeons, etc., especially the squire following um, loyally the, the the master, saying look left, look right, especially when helmets became, as you know, closed and with very narrow eyelids, etc., and they they hampered vision and hearing to some important degree, and so this um, is just like an integrated system. Like it just you would have, in fact, on I don't know, on a modern tank, they all rely on one another. And it's sort of impressive to see how this arm system, how really um, um, and technically effective was on the battlefield. Naturally, we do not know too much, to be honest about that, but we understand by the same technicality of their, their, their panoplies that, and the, in fact, the combination of this type of troops, that there was a very in-depth sort of um, um, reliance on this mechanism. Right. Also because, uh, yes, there were deadly weapons around, like crossbows, etc., were designed to take down horses mostly, but um, the, uh, in fact, the, I mean, we live in worlds with, again, drones, helicopters, tanks, etc. You have to think that, literally, at, in that time, the, the most dangerous thing you can, the most powerful thing you can face is really a band of these knights. Right? There is literally no other force. You can have, of course, a castle for stopping them. You can have... Uh, a trebuchet to smash one with one shot, but generally speaking, that just the way the knight is designed is really literally to take everything possible against and still kind of coming out of there that alive, or at least neutralizing um, that sort of effect, also thanks to the this support uh, troops that would fight alongside them. Um, so the, uh, the the sergeants would have been really a cut, right? It would have been they would have worn, depending on the situation, chainmail and or uh, padded armor and used a variety of weapons such as spears, axes, bows, and swords. Right? And uh, we can't stress how really important and um, vital for uh, the knights' warfare they really were. It's just a, a bit like the unsung, um, not necessarily heroes, but you know something akin to that um, in... Uh, medieval feudal warfare uh, especially now consider that the term the term sergeant is uh as we look at the etymology i mean you know what what it is it has to do with the latin servitium it's uh, the, the the servientes armorum it's the the guys who serve literally right they get service and um and that therefore are you understand there is a sort of um even free sort of professional semantics into that. These were truly mercenaries at some point. Uh, there were different types of troops fitting this category. It's, and it's important to stress that from a tactical point of view, of course, there were equivalents of the sergeants for this reason in many other circumstances. Right? Um, 
for example, in communal warfare, you would find other terminologies uh, for which you would have the same identical thing. The militas was actually the universal term, in fact, to define mostly these armored fighters. And this remains really very standard. So, um, as we were saying before, especially in the 13th century, when uh, surgeons had become as heavy as their masters, it didn't even make a sense to, to specify again who these militants really were. I mean, I've been working, as you know, a long time with um, medieval um, narrative sources that are really the, the bread of, of the military historian. And, of course, most of what you get from a battle is saying maybe, yeah, that these were all mostly coalition armies, right, uh, given the political fragmentation of the time. So, I don't know. You hear from this duchy, 200 militas came. Now, were these just knights? Or were these, like, we have to multiply it for three? Because, I don't know, they had other two uh, horsemen together with them. Um, the the obvious thing is that the approximate ancia non sunt multiplicanda preter necessitatem, just to quote the famous Occam's phrase. Um, but the impression is that simply there were 200 horsemen, right? Basically, heavily armored one, right? And then you, nobody tells you unless you have a, I don't know, a condotta or, or hindenture uh, document uh, how many was what. And very often, um, you don't have it, like, this is also against those who are fixated with archives, like, it's not that in archives you're, you're able to, to actually find an information uh, regarding the, I don't know, that tells you what an entire army in a given place was actually composed by. There is only one source that doesn't even tell that in a truly organic sense to reconstruct, like, how fully what the army really was, um, and it's quite unique in its kind. And it's just for one battle in the entire medieval millennium. Um, so the best you can rely on is either, as always, the chronicles that are actually quite spot on regarding the, the actual information they provide, if you know how to read them, and to approximate even what they're trying to say sometimes in a more or less exaggerated way. Um, or, again, these other hiring contracts that, however, will tell you randomly, they're very rare things, like, you know, for, I don't know, 200 battles that you can reconstruct uh, from the Chronicles, you will get, if you're lucky, maybe one, but not even, I think, a condotta system, say, contract that tells you that maybe, again, this condotta was for 400 men. And they ha you have literally no idea of how this 400 men would fit, like, I don't know, an army of 3,000 cavalry and 30,000 infantry. Um, because literally we do not have the sources that tell us how to link these things uh, in the single battles, etc. We are completely beyond that. There is no way we will ever be able to reconstruct it. There are simply not the sources that tell you that by scale. Right? We know that. Um, and these are the limits that we have to accept. So um, sometimes you do find some actual explicit idea of how many sergeants would, were supposed to be fielded in proportion to the knights. Uh, you have um, even, again, some battle orders, maybe in the narrative sources, really telling you, like, these armies that were, I don't know, 300 knights and 1,000 sergeants or stuff like that. But it's the, ser it's the term sergeant that we do not necessarily... Um, find, uh, first of all, an homogeneity for all the period in meaning, but also that can vary, like that different sources can describe in different ways, right? Um, the idea is that, the cru say, in this crusading context, the, the mounted surgeon would be also an armored horseman. Armored, not necessarily even just with metal, there is all a debate regarding how light were troops, right? Especially in contexts where they had to fight against lighter enemies on average, um, like in the Near East, where it's also pretty hot. Um, and people say that, that I found multiple times in some battles, even in, I don't know, in Central Europe, where people were so, like, fighting in summer, fighting with a metal armor, that they would prefer to actually take it off 
because they were exhausted by that then protecting themselves uh it's not frequent it's not normal it's not it's it's, it's exceptional as far as we understand but there is also another aspect we will see now that is notoriously in the holy land the ultramar states suffered of first of all a lack of manpower and such of resources for especially armored personnel so the idea is that uh um let's say an average frankish mounted surgeon fighting in the near east would be lighter than its counterpart or even the, the same guy literally from a personal point of view fighting in europe for different reasons right um what we can define the surgeon like and distinguish it like from the knight is someone of lesser status available in general to the frankish host i mean this didn't necessarily even have to be crusaders as such they didn't they could be as we will see now even turcopoles so literally guys who had um been uh you know that, that were hired because they for for in other ways that have not to do literally with the with the feudal system as such even as mercenaries or maybe with through other forms that would have not corresponded to the typical sergeant in in europe all right um and in fact we have a variety of terms used by the sources such as milites gregari milites plebei equites levis armature sergeant a cheval servientes loricati and and actually many others so let's try to break this down briefly in a linguistic and technological sense uh, so you find here first of all the difference between okay we have milites as a consul so the milas remember was sort of the average soldier right the, the roman legionnaire was a milas in the middle ages this tends to be applied just to to the privatization and feudalization of the system to the actual knight uh, and or anyone that fundamentally was paid as a mer as an equivalent of that as a mercenary as a professional of some sort so these guys fit because by this point the milas had acquired the synonymity with um with the sort of armored horseman of some sort it's the guy normally serving on horseback uh, or with a horse let's say better um meaning that they had to provide the horse right you know that all the recruitment system since ever um in europe from antiquity throughout the middle ages were all about this sort of classes of recruitment for which uh, the more you have and the more you have to serve with right this reflects of course the preeminence of the uh, of the upper classes uh, and so the the top one was uh, the top classes were to serve on horseback uh, and just say the the top one had to, to serve on horseback but with ultra heavy armor so it would be these lower classes of recruitment um, that, as you know, at this time were not really followed to the latter, meaning that these were ideal systems from which, in theory, every, per, every freeman had to serve regularly in arms. But you know that the feudal recruitment never, um, I mean, it did exist, but it never quite really worked. Um, by the, I made multiple visits explaining how, uh, even one recently about the recruitment of the French uh, knights during the 13th century, which I think is quite fitting, uh, passing from, in fact, the uh, the, the feudal levies uh, to the full monetiz monetization of service, with the monetization of service actually having been normal um, since ever, like at least from the high middle ages um, uh, after the basically, especially from the 12th to 13th century again being the norm uh as opposed to the old feudal levy that yes it was it was there on on uh, parchment on paper but did not necessarily correspond how let's say the majority of troops was actually recruited like also because the feudal levies were normally paid by this point as well right it was all uh we talked we made lots of videos about this if you look at feudal warfare feudal europe etc you will find plenty of videos i made on this specific topic we'll keep making them about pays about again all kind of employment how they found these guys and how they put them together um so you have milas plural militas in latin uh and you find this one gregari 
This is the adjective. I remember in Latin, militas gregates, it's, it's, it's inverted from English, like when you have first the adjective and then a substantive. So here you have actually two nominatives in Latin, but um, here gregari, gregarius, is the adjectivation of the, the adjective of the milas. Milites. And um, so gregarius literally means, again, a gregarian. So someone who was associated uh, in a way or another, either as a retinue, as a client, as a mercenary, right? So someone who was not technically part of officiality, if you can call it in this modern concept, from the knights that in this sense were serving, um, because they were increasingly part of a more structured and elite um, and detached um, stratified uh, feudal hierarchy um, and um, and so you realize that the later we're talking about the more this Militas Gregari could be literally maybe even this is interesting other knights of some sort or some people of de facto even equivalent status that however were put were found were paid were just uh, considered the rulers moved with their treasure during military campaigns so that you, you could always have this guy around um, because they knew that they, you could they, they you would be paid because of that and uh, that was in great part a gluing factor right um, and especially for the crusades where you had the sort of adventuristic uh, idea of how these forces were put together to some extent um, also with a sort of uh, multinational background this this sort of made sense if you want uh, bear in mind this is not just about the crusaders this is just uh, terminology that you can find applied to any kind of lay guy out there then you have militas plebe so this stresses instead the social divide uh, the fact that these were not noblemen they were plebe they were plebeians they were commoners in a way or another so guys that were not yet made um, knights, but also that were not really likely even going to become one uh, because they were just some random guys that knew how to fight they had their own equipment they would be able to serve for in exchange of different um, revenues and um, they were this, this terminology would stress more the fact that they were uh, just not truly properly of noble blood Right. Uh, this divide would have been probably like it depends because in different parts of Europe, as you know, knights had sort of different status. Think about the German ones were largely serfs, uh, juridically. Uh, or think about the uh, the Italian communes that had basically just a, a, a census criteria of recruitment. So these guys were not previous noblemen, but they were as as rich as them, and so were expected to fight exactly with the same panoply, and they would. Some of them were also, of course, of feudal stock, but they had sort of blended in and in the communal idea. So it's um, uh, one should make an entire video just to statistically and locate all these uh, terminologies in, in each single context. And it's not easy at all. Right, it's a huge work, and I don't think anyone has ever ever written a PhD thesis on on this topic. It would be a great idea if you're very fixated with uh, this kind of definitions. But it's important to think them. Now, equites levis armature is um, also a very frequent term that doesn't quite necessarily refer to the sergeant. It's not ne necessarily a synonym. Um, mm, there is, um, I, I found this terminology applied not much to the equites uh, for my period, but to the infantry. There is an idea that where some infantry, like they were coerced, especially in the for front ranks and the others were lighter. Um, and literally to, talking about the heavy infantry, the melee one, not the uh, the archers that sometimes were called velites in the Roman way. If, if you want, who, who were the skirmisher? Who were the, uh, the skirmishers of the ancient world? Um, you know, in in the Middle Ages, crossbowmen, archers, right? Welcome to medieval warfare, um, and it was, and they really had basically the same function. If you really, also that's why they called them this way. Um, Equites levis armature literally means 
horsemen with uh, lighter armor. The difference between Militas and Equites is that Equites is a generic term for horsemen, doesn't stress the fact of being a soldier in ancient Latin, and so at this time it would be used as a um, uh, more in, in a social sense, um, like these were equitas, so they were guys fighting on horseback with lighter equipment, but they, they in this sense they weren't militas, they were knights. Um, this is not even so stringent, I mean you do find some militas that are also called equitas, because these equitas could be, in fact th there wouldn't be the distinction levis armatura, otherwise also heavily armored. Right, uh, equites gravis armature. Right, in in that case, but you never find it. At that point, you find uh, militas. In said, I you find you do find peditas. That is the infantry, uh, gravis graviore, etc. Et uh, depending on what we're, what the terminology really was, because we're still talking about heavy guys, heavy cavalry, and heavy. Uh, heavy infantry, whenever, especially in Europe, we find this terminology, because as we know in Europe, uh, missile troops are not so quantitatively out there uh, as opposed to other parts of the world for the aforementioned reason of heaviness, of bulkiness. Um, and so, even when there are ex excellent um, missile towers like crossbowmen, etc., that were pretty darn good against also the horse archers of, of the Muslims of the Crusade, they're still containing numbers, right? And so, even about that, as you know, I have my my things going on with the, the concept of, uh, you know, crossbow versus longbow during the hundred years, but if you look at uh, the number of crossbow, very often it was very limited, and and even though it was the single most prevalent type of missile trooper at the time, so think about their power and comparisons, it's often an underestimated uh, uh, concept, but especially as we were saying before, especially in the ultramar states, you would you do have this uh, for the especially for the previous centuries and for the type of enemies that the Crusaders were fighting. This concept of Equitas Levis Armatura used to literally say these guys were truly lighter compared to even what an average surge, ha armored sergeant would have been in Europe, right? These guys could be horse archers, they could be turcopoles, they could be, help. maybe guys born and bred and trained in Europe, but literally having learned to fight as turcopoles, so as Turks uh, in in the Holy Land. Um, so all kind of, and consider as always, don't pre be prejudiced about this, that the um, average knight was absolutely and perfectly capable of fighting as a horse archer everywhere with single top performance available. The point is that they were so well trained and equipped for, for a completely different type of, of, of fighting that was of course superior to the one of these one of these other lighter troops and so they wouldn't. But um, it was, even if they didn't like to publicize it more than much it would have been completely different even for a medieval knight to have a uh, completely, I mean, um, frequent for a medieval knight to, to have even a crossbow as a side weapon. It wouldn't be anything strange was the case, and um, chances are that in the Holy Land this happened more frequently than in Europe, right? And so, to, to point this out, these were uh, guys with lighter armor, but they could really be the equivalent of a sergeant in the measure in which they're truly just something less than the knights, so they do tend to be poorer, more poorly and lightly equipped, because status and tactical function that went in parallel. The lighter you are, the more dynamic you are, the, the cheaper you are, so the more numerous you are, but also the less effective individually you are, so you are, doctrinally we can say, framed in different ways. Um, and again, the units under which these guys serve, within which these guys served, were all structured in that sort of they had to fight basically unless they were dismounted um, all together. I mean they would fight all together also when they were dismounted but with sort of more detachment between the single individuals in the way they they operated. Um, infantry was also aggressive. It's a myth that medieval uh, and the hope that nobody ever believed that the infantry, medieval infantry did not advance or did not take on the enemies. They did, right? What they usually didn't do was, of course, to attack cavalry frontally. Uh, 
that they prefer to stay uh, there and in in uh, and receive the impact if they could which normally wouldn't even they're doing and in fact that's why they always vote in, on the sides of next to the or behind the, the their heavies and heavy cavalry when this broke the, this guy's broke as well because uh, as we've seen cavalry was more often the decisive arm um, during the Crusades, you have a lot of horse archery from the enemy, for which uh, we've seen it in the video about the Battle of Hatton, etc. Um, it was normal, and just like a pain behind for the same Muslims, for, for the Crusaders to just stop their columns, to form some sort of shield walls to protect themselves from the arrows, and to just have the horses within these walls of men that were mostly infantry and or dismounted horsemen, also because some of them had their mounts injured, uh, and rendered, uh, in fact, useless uh, for prolonged mounted fighting. So there was this kind of, um, you know, evenience in which you could understand why, uh, say, of course, these guys would be pointed out with this terminology. Then we have a French, who of course, was the dominating language and culture during the Crusades uh, uh, in, uh, in the Holy Land and the the altar mayor, in fact, in French. Sergeant Cheval. So, sergeant on horseback. Right? Or with a horse. Um, and then you have Servientes Loricati. This is interesting because it stresses instead. Um, you see how these terms are sometimes even semantically and conceptually opposed to one another. I mean, here, Servientes Loricati literally means that they are surgeons. So you do have properly the term surgeon. Um, loricatus means uh, with with an actual lorica, with an armor, with it, that is essentially the heavy one, uh, the 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 you know the, the coat of mail as you can imagine for for the knight as well. So this would stress rather the fact that they were truly surgeons, not knights, but that they were as armored as knights. Uh, and again, we're not lucky to find this terminology and uh, it's always necessary to look at the single source and saying well uh, say I have to read at least the entire chronicle to understand how this guy uses the term for me to understand whether he is particularly serious about this definition if it is going to be if he's technical is just a way of saying if there are other terms he uses if maybe it's just a rhetorical I don't know this is vocabulary choice not to repeat himself you do find this often and you must get acquainted and, and sensitized to that guy's that author's particular uh, vocabulary lexicon and um, just un trying to understand in the context in which the term is used why is it used what is that he's stressing he's stressing the, the social status of these guys the way they were kept um, you know, the way they, they operated in general. Um, that's all something you must ask to the single source from a general, a general background. And you'll never have the, the full certainty of this, but you, it does require a very important historical, philological, literary work to fully comprehend, right? So if you have studied, again, enough of a single context, like it can be this one of the Crusades, armies, etc., you'll be able, after some years of intense, let's say, academic research, be able to, just by your guts, to say, okay, well, this is it, right? It means this because, uh, and you don't have to provide with an explanation, say, for example, because there was no other term normally used. In fact, the most common in general uh, throughout all this period is mili milas slash militas, so it's... Um, uh, it's mostly what you get, uh, and it's the basic one, it's the most conceptually fundamental one. Heavily armored guys, I mean, if you reason as a military story and specialized medieval combat, medieval tactics, you do know that in this context, more, more than else, what really mattered was how many armored horsemen or armored fighting men you really had, right, in the heavy sense. And so that's what they looked at mostly, and the rest were all troops that were operating in function and also under, hence the concept of surgeon, the those heavy guys, right? Um, 
uh, all these terms, in fact, are generally speaking used for mounted men that did not have a knightly status. Right, the aforementioned terms we used with their objectives, etc. They fundamentally meant this: mount, so non-knightly um, horsemen, right? Uh, that does not mean necessarily sergeants. I mean, within this, these you do find, in fact, the servientes more or less specified, um, but um, they're just part of that, right? Not every single one of these guys. Uh, as a lighter type of horseman was necessarily a sergeant. Uh, and so there is not just the non knightly element of the nobleman's retinues, that would be the single most common source of, of the sergeantry, but also other type of troops, especially in those areas in which um, towns were subordinated to feudal lords, like in most of Europe. Uh, so at that point you would have the wealthier burghers of the towns serving as sergeants uh, because they weren't quite uh, military professionals as such, but they ha were rich enough to provide with that equipment. And this is fascinating because, um, as we were saying before, for example, in the Italian communes or, uh, I don't know, in Spain you find the Caballeros Villanos in the latter, for example, you do have a sense that there were some differences. Uh, every era of Europe is different in this sense, but that the essence of the heavily armored professional, uh, in fact, Milas, was pretty much the same thing, right? There is no way to say clearly, like, what, you know, ah, these guys, just by the typology of their instruction, were better or worse. I've been studying medieval warfare for a long time now, and, and I can't say that. Right, I can't see some national divide in terms of how these troops were used or certain social changes, of course, that were going on. But say, whenever you do, maybe quantitatively speaking, you do find more foreign mercenaries than these guys. But when we're talking about local uh, milites uh, from these, even from this uh, urban context, they are basically the same thing. I mean, you can't say these were people that lived in a different way, because simply... The equivalent of the feudal elite was present in the cities, even when these did, did not recognize much of a feudal hierarchy, even though they did always, but say sometimes in a platonic way, like I don't know, in fact, the, in the Lombard League at, at Similia, right? Uh, and even this is not so easy to categorize, right? In any case, uh, the sense that, especially in the Holy Land, uh, there were that was not historically a feudal land, right? It was part of that um, post-Roman world that the Arabs had fundamentally tried to preserve a, a bureaucratic, centralized, in fact, a Roman Sasanian model-based system. Um, the city, the urban militias, um, I made a video about the Fatimid army organization, and similarly realized that um, this cities of Syria, of, of Palestine, were pretty tough, right? They they did have, they, they were not, like again, like the, we do not witness an infantry development akin to the one of Western Europe. Many people say, oh, where did they copy these tactics? It's all, it all came from these, everything came from these, the heavily armored, no, right? Western Europe was always basically ahead, but especially by this point, um, as far as this, um, Truly autonomous urban cultures were to provide with that kind of forces. But the idea, as we've seen again for that video about the army organization of um, of Jerusalem, is that there were many more towns. So some sort of urban context in, in, in those areas, like of, of the Jerusalem, uh, the Jerusalemitan kingdom, then they would have been, say, in the north of France. They did have actually all powerful towns with tough militia of all respect, right? But that definitely, just like in Palestine, were subordinated to um, to this bulky feudal system, right? Um, this is pretty evident. Again, uh, France is the, the cradle of feudalism, and uh, uh, this expands throughout this time uh, pretty much everywhere in Europe, the Mediterranean, to a degree that makes, again, this feudal subordination of the towns to the elite normal. Uh, it's not always the same. So, again, you, if you do find 
certain city states that are really able to take on uh, in open field let's say imperial cavalry you understand that that's that's and they fight with cavalry on their own. They they they're basically the, they are the equivalent of that. You can't even again find a distinction. I made multiple videos even about knightly arms and armor that shows you different. Um, uh, it's mostly about armor, uh, conceptually for the military, historical military unit series. But it focuses on, in fact, this various different evidence of arms and armor, different parts of Europe. It's basically the same, notoriously evolving. Uh, at a very few years of distance um, uh, of distance from one another and um, a really um, uh, exemplifying the fact that we're talking about the same troops right but in, in 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 the world that had been conquered in the ultramar states things were slightly different right they were in as much as they uh, there wasn't really a feudal society, right? It was just like a bit in the Byzantine world, right? I mean, it was something tending toward that, but not being quite that. And so in that context, it's possible that uh, the idea of a sergeant serving because it was like a wealthier burger of a town. So as a guy who was less of a true feudal professional, can be there as a concept. But always bear in mind that what really the administration of these polities cared about was not who would serve but the amount of equipment and so the equivalent wealth put at war that this, that community could provide. In fact, this was absolutely normal also elsewhere, like you maybe owed military service to your feudal lord, you could, you could send someone else. I mean, as long as you paid this guy with armor, horse, uh, you know, then the, the needed, everybody was okay. Right, and this was the opportunity also for poorer people to go fight in in the uh, in the stead of the guys. Also, the same nobility was gentrifying to some degree. They didn't necessarily all want to go to fight and to be soldiers. Right, so this had always been somehow common, and so the combat, the combativeness of of these individuals cannot be simply patterned on the base of where did the surgeons come from. And there is no doubt, in some points of here sergeants would be as tough and performing as the knights um so as we we're saying the sergeants are not really always they are not really not always easy to find in the sources at all right uh the, the list is always about the knights um there is at best like terms like accepting for example full care of shaft one of the most important sources also for crusade for crusading warfare admits in one passage only however something like quote two uh, i mean those who were not counted as knights although they were mounted right so this is a very important we're talking about probably the fullest western frankish um militariness um and this is I think a very beautiful discriminant that tells you that, that what the practice really was. I mean, those who were not counted as knights, although they were mounted, means that even though, I mean, being mounted was essentially the equivalent of being a knight, conceptually. It's obvious that these guys were not considered knights or counted as knights, uh, in this case especially, because they... Um, uh, they evidently were not counted by someone as knights, uh, even in the list of how many troops were there. So that is to say, I don't know, there were 800 knights, plus those who were not, that they were mounted, but were and they were not knights, but we do not really know who they were, or how many they were. So this is the kind of attitude. But the idea is from uh, the High Middle Ages that if you really fight mounted, you're basically the equivalent of a milas, so which not necessarily overlaps with a knight, um, unless, of course, you use the term improperly. If you, you know, if we are not picky, you can say a medieval knight. Just talking about the general medieval knight, uh, the stereotype medieval knight. But obviously, enough. Um, there is, um, um, uh, let's say, a, an, say an equivalence that can that does get beyond the social status, and this is also again particularly important. Uh, for the sake of this uh, concept, as we've seen, they were uh, the sergeants were less heavily equipped than the knights. Hence, uh, 
the term levis armatura that we encountered like and this is important for the ultramar states as we've seen um especially you, you know i made a, one of the earliest videos i made on Sharpunkt was observing how the kingdom of jerusalem had actually a hell of a potential many people think that oh no this was a doom enterprise the crusaders should have not gone there there was nothing are you kidding me the the king of jerusalem wanted, was one of the most potentially endowed powers out there um and uh, they had lots of political strategic advantages also just geographically and territorially but the problem was always um putting together fighters because most Europeans were not really interested in the Holy Land, which is a reason why eventually this fell to the Muslims back again. Not, again, any specific military superiority in a technical sense from the, the Muslim side, but actually this fact that they had a very few troops. Also, the, the military orders were established, in a sense, to be even that sort of ultra-elite and troop backbone of the, uh, the Ultramar armies because right they needed to be more... Um, the matters of Stilis, uh given the, the fewer troops available there, had to provide with this ultra-elite that would try to make up for the lack of numbers. So the idea is that uh, next to these guys, was, given that it was very difficult to put together knights, it was sort of easier to have compensated with lighter troops in the Near East. Um, and so these guys being who knows room actually in person, but wearing lighter or even old-fashioned armor. Consider this that albeit, and I made multiple videos about you know about Syrian warfare um, uh, in the Levant in this period, etc. That of course the center of your, I mean, probably this feudal Western knightly arms and armor was Western Europe, right? France, Italy. Really, these are the the, the places with the most advanced military technology, it wouldn't be easy to replicate that as it wasn't possible to replicate the same feudal system fully in the Western model in the Holy Land. So even though you had uh, fully equipped Western knights and others coming st straight from Europe, etc., you would have to make up with local troops that truly were not, let's say, the same, for which that sort of um, type of trooper was designed like as opposed to to Europe where you would really find heavier troops even on foot etc in the lower ranks um, and that therefore would influence the same way these knights themselves really fought and so it's more likely that the sergeants uh, in the Holy Land were habituated for multiple reasons including the ones we listed at the beginning uh, it's more likely equipped than the militas. In any case, what truly these guys were, were lancers and swordsmen, right? Um, and they would normally just perform the same tactical role of the militas. And they were considered in part as militas, uh, semantically as well. There are a lot of beautiful pictures. Um, I use today the, the single one famous one for medieval <laughs> of warfare of the time. Uh, but, for example, there are beautiful Matthew Paris drawings of crusade battles uh, that can tell you, like, this This is a, a sergeant. Imagine, uh, again, even just a guy just with a with a cloth coat of mail, um, shield lengths, and maybe not, as you say in, in the illustrations here, like, not the full enclosed helmet, right? Uh, this could be true, or uh, like again, the, the older you back in, uh, you go, the back, the more back you go in time, and sort of the more primitive, also the knightly equipment would look like, but it also fundamentally the same. Sometimes you could think the sergeants had even just less updated armor rather than else. That did make a difference, all right? Um, so if we had to approximate, um, also chronologically put in this sort of in-between. Um, and in strictly feudal terminology, the sergeant was by the late 12th century, so in the moment also in which the knight really becomes another guy compared to these ones, because the um, the militia, the, the militas proper, uh, closed their ranks socially and politically, and so these guys are properly more formally 
identifiable in a social sense than all the others, even when these re- the, did had been fighting essentially as them to, to a great extent, and that's why the surgeon figure is important, um, would be um, the holder of grant of land called a surgeonty, in fact, uh, from, again, the idea of the servitium, that in Europe usually was half the size of a knight's fee. This is also fascinating, but don't let yourself be fooled by that. It doesn't necessarily mean that the sergeant was sort of equivalent to half of a knight. At some point it could be, because especially, again, in later times, the, 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 the single man at arms became ever heavier, and so, yes, at that point you do have also... It's a bit of difficult the uh, explaining how would they really operate with one another if there weren't so many lighter troops at any point but it's also a matter of wealth distribution you can also fight in a battle line with just ultra heavy guys uh, without too much of a support but there was always an internal segmentation of some sort I mean it doesn't make any sense to think that they were just um, you know the 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 knight was just routinely followed by a retinue that was necessarily just lighter than than him, right? Plus, the really interesting thing is that these guys were technically surgeons, so fighting for somebody else who was a guy who was richer than them, and that in this reason was not uniquely providing like equipping himself, arming himself with better um, with a better panoply, let's say, and so with all the tactical consequences, but this guy would use part of that wealth to actually pay these guys and provide for the logistics, even of these small bands of two, three horsemen, because it costs a freaking lot, right? Just to have these horses, this plus the spare ones, and think about all the travel to reach the the Holy Land from Europe. So uh, there was this minimal sort of logistical autonomy managed by the, the knight that thus would spend proportionally much more money for for that in addition to his, the one to his own equipment so this half the size of a nice feet and naturally could wildly uh, change uh, just even in the late uh, the aforementioned late 12th century for not talking about the entire period here it's not necessarily the equivalent of a sort of a double knight necessarily right and consider this that doesn't matter how um, heavier the knightly equipment gets from the 11th to the 13th century but it's not a radical change e- either, right? It wasn't, at the beginning of the period, much of a different from difference in substance from, or even at the end of the period, from a knight from Charlemagne's time, right? The essentials were always there. But the sergeant equipment would also change. So we do not really know what the fluctuations in terms of what the sergeant would be more or less performing like compared to, to, a, to a knight would actually look like, right? So... Um, it's it's a completely different story. Um, contemporary chroniclers more often tend to use the word "sergeant" in its variant as blanket terms from non all for all non knightly soldiers, which is again more a status indicator than else, right? Uh, but and this is also the other picture: many sergeants were also infantry, and were considered such. And they were truly like lighter, less effective, whatever, of course, in knights. Um, so this is just what, again, how do you measure, even just quantitatively speaking, how many uh, cavalry or infantry sergeants were there, even just by issue, by contract, not how they would eventually fight in the battle, where cavalry could dismount even. So everything is very complex. And complicated, and most things we do not really know. Uh, as I was saying, recalling before, I think that just e- even Turkopoles were sometimes described as Sergeant, and they could really be not just Turkopoles in, in an ethnic sense, at least in the originary meaning of the same, but um, uh, let's say uh, uh, just Europeans themselves that had learned to fight that way. Um, in the Crusades, or maybe there were just Europeans that lived in the Crusade from generations, but they had started to fight as Turkopoles uh, in the same way because they were skilled in that fashion. Right, so um, this is really the, the picture of the surgeonry, and again, tactically speaking, these guys would perform some of the um, most uh, 
um, important tactical roles um, f on, on the battlefield, especially in the smaller um, skirmishes that, um, I mean skirmishes in a sense of smaller engagements where things were not much about just a battle line, but I don't know, raiding castles, pillaging, burning, laying waste, etc. Where some would say the most typical encounters would have happened, and in the sense where this likely more uh, likely more likely hipped and more agile uh, individuals would be able even be more suitable than the heavier guys. And very often, this is a thing that we tend to forget, they could cover the retreat to, of the of the heavier knights. And so sacrificing themselves, because here what, what is ferociously implied is that, of course, there was an enormous sense of, uh, of fealty, of duty, of, again, if you were subjected to a guy that even gave you the means to fight and to be under him, you would have to be no less than him just to be promoted and earning that social status, that consideration, that security. So some of these guys committed also the, some of the most heroic actions, like sacrificing themselves to let their, their lord escape, etc. And you can understand how they even overlap the figure of the squires uh, at some point. Say the sergeant belongs to a sort of more socially, systemically, structurally developed military system, where it's not much about the older idea, okay, I go at war with my squire, and that's it, right? You start needing more spare horses, you start needing sort of you you just it, it depends on the retinue that you really have like the the military companies um uh were uh, historically developing from the same the same knightly retinues and at some point towards the end of the 13th century it could be i don't know 20 man 30 man 40 100 and so you have the later companies that last until the the 17th century um in a say in the the, the 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 medieval way that they had always been. So who were the guys who fought in these units? Well, the larger the unit, the more professional the system. Of course, the more standardized even their equipment to a certain extent really was. Even though there was always a, a segmentation within the same units. So um, it's particularly important to stress how, um, especially for in fact the, the lighter troops, we know less than for the knights, for the, the, the real heroes of, of the situation, at least ideally. But but they were really something, I mean, that you wouldn't like to kid with. The sergeants having, if you want, even of a more, uh, again, dirty um, job experience profile that wouldn't make them less fearsome in many contexts and even just being tactically more useful in some of them than, than the ultra-heavy knight. Right, that however is not far away from them conceptually what they did and what it was and so um, this has a lot to do with again with even the, the type of enemy uh, with the ways that the crusader states essentially adapted their warfare to the wants of different peoples but as we said before the essentials are always those ones you really do not see throughout um, these centuries ma many variations many ways of um, fighting differently or fighting in ways that were uh, often used also in Europe but do not fit the, the ideal chivalric order because um, war is a mess and everything gets down to how eventually you were able to win you know where and another with the best you have and so this gets to something particularly important in, in a crusader um, condition of course we, we imagine the sergeants being often heavier than their Muslim sort of lesser trooper counterpart right just like it was the case on average for the the level of, of equipment right uh, and um, so following the idea that they were sort of part of a bulkier system system brought from Europe with a in, in these lands um, and really they, doing a, a great job right differently from what it's commonly said like the uh, the ultramare was not lost because of military inferiority was lost because of lack as always of political interest to some extent um even if it's it's painful to realize but uh, it's important to distinguish the two plans especially the technical one from the broader um the one that makes sense in a broader um political one right and that's i think 
um, particularly relevant to to this topic. Naturally, we will keep talking about surgeons. We'll keep talking about the Crusades warfare. Um, again, I wish you really the most beautiful 24, 2024. Um, I really hope we're going to work a lot this year and um, right, making Schwerpunkt what really deserves to be. Thank you for all your support. I'm really um, blessed and grateful um, uh, for this uh, for the, the previous year and for the just the support I've received this first this first um, hours I, I, I admit I'm recording this the, the day before but you know that that's what you get and so I, I make it uh, already with the wishes that I have been had have been arriving uh, really the most beautiful 2024 and my thanks uh, to you so see you next time thank you heartily for listening to me bye